at some point, all of this spend has to make money, right? Otherwise, you're, you're going to look really foolish for having spent 20 and 30 and $40 billion. So Nick, if you just go back to the, to the revenue slide of NVIDIA, I can try to give you a framing of this, at least the way that I think about it. So if, if you look at this, like what you're talking about is, look, who is going to spend $22.1 billion? Well, you said it, Jason, it's all a big tech. Why? Because they have that money on the balance sheet sitting idle. But when you spend $22 billion, their investors are going to demand a rate of return on that. Mm. And so if you think about what a reasonable rate of return is, call it 30, 40, 50%, and then you factor in, and that's profit, and then you factor in all of the other things that need to support that, that $22 billion of spend needs to generate probably $45 billion of revenue. Mm. And so Jason, the question to your point and to Friedberg's point, the $64,000 question is, who in this last quarter is going to make $45 billion on that $22 billion of spend? And again, what I would tell you to be really honest about this is that what you're seeing is more about big companies muscling people around with their balance sheet and being able to go to NVIDIA and say, I will give you committed pre-purchases over the next three or four quarters and less about here is a product that I'm shipping that actually makes money, which I need enormous more compute resources for. It's not the latter. Most of the apps, the overwhelming majority of the apps that we're seeing in AI today are toy apps that are run as proofs of concept and demos and run in a sandbox. It is not production code. This is not we've rebuilt the entire autopilot system for the Boeing and it's now run with agents and bots and all of this training. That's not what's happening. So it is a really important question. Today, the demand is clear. It's the big guys with huge gobs of money. And by the way, NVIDIA is super smart to take it because they can now forecast demand for the next two or three quarters. I think we still need to see the next big thing. And if you look in the past, what the past has showed you, it's the big guys don't really invent the new things that make a ton of money. It's the new guys who, because they don't have a lot of money and they have to be a little bit more industrious, come up with something really authentic and new. Yeah, constraint makes for great art. Yeah, We haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So the buzz around the RTX 50 series, especially the RTX 5090, is substantial and for good reason. Leaks suggest that the RTX 5090 could feature 24 GB of GDDR7 memory. This is not just a marginal upgrade. GDDR7 is the successor to GDDR6X, promising greater chip density and faster data transfer speeds. GDDR7 memory marks a substantial improvement over GDDR6X, providing higher bandwidth and efficiency. This enhancement is critical because it directly translates to better performance in graphics-intensive tasks. The increased memory bandwidth can support higher frame rates, more detailed textures, and more complex shaders. For gamers, this means smoother gameplay and more immersive experiences. For professionals, such as those in video editing, 3D rendering, and AI development, the performance gains could lead to significant productivity boosts. The RTX 5090 is rumored to be exceptionally powerful for running path tracing, a rendering technique that simulates the way light interacts with objects in the real world. Path tracing can produce stunningly realistic images, but is extremely resource intensive. The real question is how much of an advantage do they have, particularly that there is this need to use fabs to build replacement technology. So over time, will there be better solutions that use hardware that's not as good, but the software figures out and they build new architecture for running on that hardware in a way that kind of mimics what we saw in the early days of the build out of the internet. So um, TBD, right? The same is true in, in, in switches, right? So in networking, a lot of the high-end, high-quality networking companies got beaten up when lower-cost solutions came to market later. And so they looked like they were going to be the biggest business ever. I mean, you could look at Cisco during the early days of the internet build-out, and everyone thought Cisco was uh, the picks and shovels of the internet, and they were going to make all the, all the values going to accrue to Cisco. So we're kind of in that same phase right now with NVIDIA. The real question is, is this going to be a much harder hill to compete on 
than we've ever seen, given the development cycle on chips and the requirement to use these fabs to build chips. It may be a harder hill to kind of get up. Sex. So we'll see. Your thoughts, you think um, we're getting to the point where maybe we'll have bought too many of these, uh, built out too much infrastructure, and it will take time for the application layer, as Freeberg was alluding to, to monetize it? Well, I think the question everyone's asking right now is, are, are these results sustainable? Can NVIDIA keep growing at these astounding rates? You know, will the build out continue? And the comparison everyone's making is to Cisco. And there's this chart that's been going around overlaying the NVIDIA stock price on the Cisco stock price. And you can see here the orange line is NVIDIA and the blue line is Cisco. And it's almost like a, a perfect match. Now, what happened is that at a similar point in the original build out of the internet of the dot com era, you had the market crash at the end of March of uh, 2000. And Cisco never really recovered from that peak valuation. Um, but I think there's a lot of reasons to believe NVIDIA is different. One is that if you look at NVIDIA's multiples, they're nowhere near where Cisco's were back then. So the market in 1999 and early 2000 was way more bubbly than it is now. So NVIDIA's valuation is much more grounded in real revenue, real margins, real profit. Second, you have the issue of competitive moat. Cisco was selling servers and networking equipment. Fundamentally, that equipment was much easier to copy and commoditize than GPUs. These GPU chips are really complicated. I think Jensen made the point that their Hopper 100 product, he said, you know, don't even think of it just like a chip. There's actually 35,000 components in this product and it weighs 70 pounds. This is yeah. more like a mainframe computer or something that's dedicated to processing. Yeah, it's somewhere between a rack server and the entire rack. Yeah, it's right. shiny and it's heavy and it's complex. It does say right. something here, Chamath, I think, about how well positioned big tech is in terms of seeing an opportunity and quickly mobilizing to capture that opportunity. These servers are being bought by you know, people like Amazon, I'm sure Apple, obviously Facebook Meta. I don't know if Google is buying them as well. I would assume so, Tesla. So everybody's buying these things and, and they had tons of cash sitting around. It is pretty amazing how nimble the industry is. And this opportunity feels like everybody is looking at it like mobile and cloud. I have to get mobilized quickly to not get disrupted. The increased memory and processing power of the RTX 5090 could make real-time path tracing a reality, pushing the boundaries of what is visually possible in games and simulations. Ray tracing, a related technology, has already been a major selling point for NVIDIA's RTX series. The RTX 50 series is expected to take ray tracing to the next level, offering even more lifelike lighting, shadows, and reflections. This advancement will not only enhance gaming experiences, but also provide superior tools for industries reliant on high-fidelity visualizations, such as architecture, automotive design, and film production. NVIDIA's GPUs are not just for gaming, they are crucial in the fields of AI and machine learning. The RTX 50 series increased performance capabilities could significantly accelerate AI training processes. More powerful GPUs can handle larger datasets and more complex models, leading to faster training times and more accurate results. This could make NVIDIA's new GPUs highly sought after in research institutions and industries that rely on machine learning, such as finance, healthcare, and autonomous driving. From an investment perspective, a significant leap in product capability often translates to increased demand, which can drive up revenue. NVIDIA's history shows that major technological advancements lead to substantial sales growth, and the RTX 50 series could be no different. Enhanced performance could mean wider adoption across various sectors, including gaming, AI research, and data centers, all of which contribute to a more robust financial outlook for NVIDIA. Traditionally, NVIDIA releases a new generation of graphics cards every two years. However, rumors suggest a shakeup in this routine. The leaks indicate that NVIDIA might release the RTX 5080 first, 
followed by the 5090 and the rest of the series throughout 2025. This staggered release could be a strategic masterstroke. Releasing the 5080 ahead of AMD's next-gen cards could give NVIDIA a significant competitive edge. AMD has been gaining ground in the GPU market, and an early release of the 5080 could capture market attention and consumer dollars before AMD's products hit the shelves. Early adoption by enthusiasts and professionals who can't wait to upgrade could drive early sales and market share gains. This strategic timing not only positions NVIDIA as a market leader, but also creates a steady revenue stream over an extended period, rather than a single, short-term spike. By staggering the release dates of the 50 series, NVIDIA can maintain a continuous presence in the market. Each new release in the series can generate fresh buzz and excitement, keeping the brand in the spotlight. This approach can also help in managing supply chains more effectively avoiding the massive initial rush and potential shortages that have plagued previous launches. For investors, this strategy could mean sustained stock performance improvements as each subsequent release in the RTX 50 series generates fresh interest and in sales. It's a way to keep the brand in the SPO. Joining me at Post 9, Bernstein's all-star analyst, Stacey Raskon. Welcome, it's good to see you in person. Good to be here, thanks for having me. So, when you see NVIDIA, do what it is doing, what is your reaction? I think you have to be there, right? I mean, I'm not surprised that it is doing what it is doing, right? We had the numbers a week or two ago, whenever it was. Um, clearly, the demand for their products is still off the charts. You've got a product cycle that it's on its way. They took the air pocket transition risk out. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's not to love? I know, but at some point, like when I talked to you um, the day of earnings, yeah. pre-number, we were, I think, at 9.50. That's right. And I think I told everybody to sort of relax. Right? You did. Right into the you, did. you said it was going to be, I think, mundane. Yeah. I, I mean, it certainly wasn't shocking. I, but I mean, to, to be fair, like... Maybe the, it was. I don't know. The, the numbers were, you know, they, they were a good beat. They were probably in line with, with uh, sort of the whisper numbers. Yeah. But they, they said two things that I think were really helpful. One is, again, they took that air pocket, like, transition risk as you go from Hopper to Blackwell. They took that off the table. Uh, and then number two, I, I think his commentary on... The pace and timing of the Blackwell ramp, their next generation product, was, was very supportive. People were thinking it was coming next year. He was pretty clear. We're going to what, what was it? He said we'll see a lot of Blackwell revenue this year. I think was the quote. Did you expect that? Um, I expected it next year. It was earlier than we thought. So at least in terms of like getting material amounts of revenue, that, that was earlier. Is that one of the reasons why you raised your price target? Well, and our, and our numbers went up materially. So it was, it was both of those reasons. But yeah, but it drove the numbers. But what do you do when the stock continues to outrun you? You know what I mean? It's like, not outrunning us yet. <laughs> so. But I mean, it's on the verge of outrunning everybody yeah. and everybody's yeah. price target. So, yeah. so how do you handle that? I, again, I think we, we've had this conversation. Where don't don't get too hung up on on the price targets. I know. I like price targets. I mean, they, the price targets matter. People look at the price target and they're like, okay, they, they do. People now don't what? Up, people don't update their target prices every single day. You know, for for now, I think you can let it run. Though I think that the story is really good. The numbers are going higher, and, and the stock, remember, it, it's not like it's expensive. Like, if the numbers come in anywhere close to where I think they can come in, the stock is very inexpensive given the growth the growth trajectory. What, what is the risk at, at this point? Yeah. Now the this, now this stock's at the highs of the day, okay? It's up 7.2%. Okay. As we're having this, another $76 yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think in the near term, like, there's not a lot of, like, negative catalysts that are on, on the way. Again, we know... The numbers are fine for now in the near term. We know the product cycles are coming. Computex what is, is, is next week. Like they'll, I don't know if they'll talk as much about data center. Computex, it would be a little weird for that, but you know they're going to be Jensen's there. Jensen's going to speak Jensen, there. Jensen's going to speak there. You know, it, it, it looks looks pretty good for now. <laughs> so. But you're literally telling me there's no risk. I mean, well, there, look, there's always. Well, I know there's the theory. Right, there's always risk. We walk outside, the bus comes. We sure. right, but. Is there legit risk? I mean, you yeah. said that they pulled forward the the Blackwell production expectation. I, 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 versus, I don't know if it was versus their expectation, but versus our, our, ours that came in. So, I mean, the, the risks are, are a few, right? So there's always that cyclical risk. Is there, you know, is it, it, that, that seems to be off the table in the near term. We can talk about longer term, but the near term, fine. Longer term, I think the worry would be that, like, there is a lot of investment that's happening, and eventually there has to be a real return on those assets, either driving revenue or driving efficiencies and saving costs, or ideally both for their customers. And if it were to turn out over time that the return is not there, then clearly the whole thing would come crumbling down for NVIDIA and for lots of others. I don't think that is the case. And it's not a risk now, but over time, certainly, like, that's, you want to see business models starting to get built on this, sure.
What about interest rates? Do they matter? Well, they're already high, right? They haven't mattered at this point. And, and, so keep going, if they keep going higher a little bit, it doesn't matter? I, 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 I don't know. Like, I'm not a macro economist. So I, I know, know, but, but I you mean, don't look at that sort of thing and say, well, it could be a risk in the near I, term. I mean, you know, interest rates go high. It does tend to drive multiples lower, although, again, it has not happened, like, especially in the semi-space. Like, multiples right. are quite high. Right, but certainly you watch it. But again, that, that's that's not idiosyncratic. That's not that's not Nvidia specific, right? Those are broad risks. Interest rates going higher and impacting things would impact lots of stuff. It's not Why just- is AMD up almost three and a half percent? Yeah, is it I, the halo on yeah, this? Yeah, probably. So again, you mentioned like the whole uh, XAI uh, uh, Musk story. Yeah, so, I mean, because like Broadcom's down. It's not like everything's up, but AMD's up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the. Players that are viewed as maybe more like direct um, beneficiaries of AI, maybe. Although I, I would argue that Broadcom is a direct beneficiary of AI as well. Um, but well, a lot I of people mean, make that argument as a cheaper way of playing Nvidia. No, at this point, it's not that much cheaper. Yeah, well, it's it's quite a bit cheaper. It's still very inexpensive. And, and by the way, Broadcom's a little bit of a different AI. Yes, about risks to Nvidia. One one other risk is competition. The hyperscalers are doing their own chips. Broadcom is a key beneficiary of that. They do the work for for, for the for the hyperscalers. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, there's only two companies out there that have really material AI stores enough to like offset anything else. Right now, it's Nvidia and Broadcom. That's kind of it, right? Do we do we know for sure whether X AI is going to spend all this money with Nvidia? I don't know that we know anything for sure yet. But it seems does seem that they are going to be they, they just you know they just raise money. It does seem they're going to be spending money. It does seem they'll likely be spending with Nvidia if they want to build an AI supercomputer over the time frame that they're talking about. They don't really have any choice. Like there's there's one option. It's Nvidia. Pricing has always been a contentious issue with NVIDIA's graphics cards. The RTX 40 series faced criticism for its high prices, and the RTX 50 series might follow suit. Speculation suggests that the RTX 5080 could launch at around $1199, with the 5090 being even more expensive. While high pricing might seem like a deterrent, it can actually be beneficial from an investment standpoint if managed correctly. Premium pricing reinforces the brand's image as a provider of top-tier, cutting-edge technology. If the performance improvements justify the cost, consumers and professionals alike are often willing to pay a premium. This pricing strategy can lead to higher profit margins and, subsequently, a more attractive bottom line for NVIDIA. Moreover, NVIDIA's pricing strategy could include various models catering to different segments of the market. By offering a range of products at different price points, NVIDIA can capture a broad audience, from casual gamers to professional users, thus maximizing their market reach and revenue potential. This tiered approach ensures that while the flagship models may carry a premium price tag, there are more affordable options available that still benefit from the technological advancements of the new generation. The potential impact of the RTX 50 series extends beyond just the gaming community. NVIDIA's GPUs are widely used in AI, machine learning, and data centers. Enhanced capabilities of the RTX 50 series could see increased adoption in these high-growth areas, further boosting NVIDIA's revenue streams. In AI and machine learning, faster and more efficient GPUs can significantly reduce processing times and enhance the performance of complex algorithms. For example, training a deep learning model that previously took days could be completed in hours with the RTX 50 series GPUs. This improvement can accelerate innovation in various fields, such as natural language processing, image recognition, and autonomous systems. Companies and research institutions are likely to invest in these powerful GPUs to stay competitive, leading to increased sales and long-term contracts for NVIDIA. For data centers, the new GPUs could provide better energy efficiency and performance, leading to cost savings and improved service offerings. Data centers are the backbone of the internet and cloud computing, and they require massive computational power to handle the ever-increasing amount of data. The RTX 50 series could offer significant improvements in processing power per watt, making them more attractive to data center operators looking to upgrade their infrastructure. This sector is experiencing rapid growth, and NVIDIA's advancements could position them as a key player in these lucrative markets. Professional graphics and virtual reality (VR) are other areas where the RTX 50 series could make a substantial impact. High-end GPUs are essential for rendering complex 3D models and simulations used in fields such as architecture, 
engineering, and entertainment. The increased performance and memory capacity of the RTX 50 series could enable more detailed and realistic visualizations, enhancing the capabilities of professionals in these industries. Similarly, VR applications require powerful GPUs to deliver immersive experiences without lag or latency. The RTX 50 series could push the boundaries of what's possible in VR, driving adoption in both consumer and professional markets. All these factors, groundbreaking performance specs, strategic release timing, and a well-structured pricing strategy, converge to create a potent recipe for NVIDIA's stock to soar. The RTX 50 series represents not just an incremental upgrade, but a significant leap forward that could redefine the market standards. NVIDIA's ability to consistently lead in technology and performance is a crucial factor for investors. The RTX 50 series, with its potential to set new benchmarks in GPU performance, reinforces NVIDIA's position as a market leader. This leadership can translate to increased market share and customer loyalty, both of which are positive indicators for stock performance. The anticipated improvements and strategic initiatives surrounding the RTX 50 series have the potential to drive substantial growth in NVIDIA's stock price. This series is not just about maintaining market leadership in graphics technology. It's about expanding influence in burgeoning sectors like AI and data centers, which promise high returns. Diversifying revenue streams across different high-growth areas reduces risk and creates multiple avenues for revenue, further strengthening NVIDIA's financial position. Investors should keep a close eye on NVIDIA's announcements and market movements. The long-term growth potential of the RTX 50 series is significant. As each new model in the series is released, it can drive fresh waves of demand and market excitement, sustaining NVIDIA's growth trajectory over an extended period. Additionally, the advancements in AI, machine learning, and data centers can open up new markets and revenue opportunities, contributing to sustained financial health and stock price appreciation. So, what do you think about the RTX 50 series and its potential impact on NVIDIA's stock? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this analysis, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more insights on tech and market trends. Thanks for watching. Well, time is running out. Secure your mini Cybertruck model today and set your collection apart from the rest. Items purchased from the official website are guaranteed to be resold later at a premium due to their unique authentication numbers.